Uh, hi, good afternoon everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. I'm super excited to talk. My name is Sean Wu. I'm a second year epidemiology PhD student with a designated emphasis in computational and genomic biology and I work under Dr. John Marshall. And I'm Fausto Bustos. I'm a fourth year PhD student in epidemiology and as, as well as a third year student in biostatistics and I work with Eva Harris. Um, so as the last two talks alluded to, mosquitoes really are important to study because although they're small, they're actually the world's deadliest animal. And this infographic, which is um, drawn to scale, shows how many human lives are lost uh, each year due to other animals. So um, sharks, which we have an annual shark week for, uh, only kill about 10 humans per year. And snakes, which collectively we all you know, are afraid of, they kill about 50,000 of our species every year. And what's remarkable is that we as a species kill roughly about half a million of each other every single year. And that's that big blue box over here. <laughs> but that number is dwarfed by the number of human lives lost every year due to mosquitoes. That's approximately 725,000. The majority of that, 80%, which would translate to 600,000 lives every year, is due to the malaria parasite alone. And in fact, malaria is such an efficient killer of the human species that by some estimates, it's killed half of all humans who have ever lived on this earth. And that's roughly uh, 54 billion people um, since 2011. So I'd like to talk a little bit about how we're using mathematical models to inform pathogen control. And um, as we heard from Dr. Harris's talk, uh, uh, mosquito-borne pathogens are an incredibly complex system, and they're really the interactions between three entirely different species, uh, humans, mosquitoes, and the pathogen themselves. So control and elimination of these pathogens requires an uh, understanding of these interactions. And I can give an example. If we deploy a new antimalarial drug that kills blood stage malaria, uh, how, do we, how will we predict that will affect the population level burden of disease? Uh, likewise, if we build a new road connecting uh, two previously disconnected towns, how will that affect flow of pathogen between these two places that were previously disconnected? So um, for that, our models need to include, um, we need to consider at least uh, three dynamics present in the system. First is human dynamics, which is um, has to do with macro scale pathogen transmission. So if I'm infected in one city, I move to another city, uh, what mosquitoes do I infect there? How long do I stay in that city? We also need to consider mosquito dynamics, which uh, has to do with uh, microscale pathogen transmission. So if I'm infected with malaria and a mosquito bites me in my home, uh, which of my neighbors are put at increased risk for subsequent transmission? Um, finally, we of course need to consider immunological and pathogen dynamics. So uh, if I'm challenged by malaria this year, how does my body react to it? And uh, if I'm challenged again by malaria next year, um, how does my reaction change uh, as opposed to the initial uh, challenge from the infectious disease? Um, of course, we don't want to just stop at understanding these infections, but we also want to use these models to inform control. So as um, my advisor, Dr. Marshall, mentioned, we're um, researching um, gene drives because it's been predicted that even with the existing suite of interventions, we wouldn't be able to successfully eliminate malaria. And currently, the software tools our group are building are being used to support the rollout of uh, new anti-malarial vaccines in West Africa. Zika virus is another pathogen that's spread by mosquitoes. And as Dr. Harris alluded to, the Zika virus is an incredibly complicated organism. And the outbreaks that were caused by Zika virus in 2016, 2015 in Latin America are incredibly complicated. They were driven by a, vari a variety of factors, including mosquito breeding patterns, as well as their flight patterns, human behaviors, such as sexual transmission, and finally, interactions of the virus itself with the human interaction with the human immune system. And when these outbreaks occur, it's important for epidemiologists to answer a variety of questions, including how many people were infected, who was infected, where and why. And when we think about, oh, OK. So you've seen this graphic before showing um, the age trends that we, um, that we observed in our study. This is a new graphic that you haven't seen before. This shows what was going on in our study with respect to where. So on this graphic yellow, which you can see here on the western half, this is the part of our study site where there were more infections. And blue on the eastern half is where there were very few infections. And we kept wondering, why is it the case that there are more infections on the western half? And that's because, oh, sorry. That's because on the western half, there's a cemetery. And what we realized is that people were bringing in vases full of flour and water and that small amount of water in an individual vase is enough to serve as a breeding ground. 
So this cemetery that was here was acting as an environmental source of infections that were spreading into the surrounding neighborhoods. And this is important to know because now that we have this understanding, we can take this to the Ministry of Health and they can conduct fumigation drives to decrease the number of mosquitoes as well as the number of infections. Um, so as we've heard, these are incredibly complex uh, dynamical systems describing infection processes. And um, for that, we need to step back and consider our time as graduate students and recognize that as exciting as research has been, um, we can't just rely on our expertise in epidemiology and biophysics. We really need um, the contribution of all the departments in public health. So from vaccinology and immunology, we can understand how antibodies and within host dynamics affect disease. Um, from environmental science, we can consider the built environment. We can consider how um, uh, urban development affects disease processes. Um, from health and social behavior, um, we can learn things about how cultural determinants of health may affect uh, contact patterns. From the fields of maternal and child health, we can learn about the placental biology and how it is that different organisms can invade this protected barrier. From the fields of nutrition, we can learn why it is that obesity and uh, body surface seemingly ask, uh, or act as risk factors for infection. And from the field of public policy, we can learn how to best translate these research findings into actual practice. And moreover, we need um, a really whole of science approach, including all of the fields uh, represented in this room, other departments in the university, as well as our collaborators, to really approach human disease from, an, uh, from a big, big picture, whole of science approach, for it is only uh, by working together hand in hand with collaborators that we can make the world a better and healthier place. Thank you. <laughs>